I'd, I, I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about Steve's impact on this lab. Um, I, I heard in the t t talks today many people um, discussing Steve in the context of his research group and all of the research that he's done. And I think everybody knows that the, um, it's a um, remarkable phenomenon to unleash Steve Chu onto a problem and see what happens and to, if he has his coworkers. So it's a very interesting experiment to see what happens when Steve uh, uh, comes into contact with a problem like uh, how to make the most use of an incredible asset like a national laboratory. It's a very different scale of problem. It involves now thousands of people <laughs> and it involves uh, a lot more resources and it's quite different than running a, a research group and uh, I think it's fair to say that the answer is already in. It's an astonishing set of results. Uh, Steve has been here only a few years and in that time uh, he's really changed the lab dramatically and uh, these are some of the characters. Oops, I'm not on. Let me get myself on there. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that. So these are some of the things that you could say that Steve came here uh, wanting to influence. And, and, and the main thing is that he's conceived of this laboratory uh, as being a place that should impact really the world uh, in dramatic ways. And, and you know that I've, I assume many of you have had the opportunity to see Steve's talks on, on energy. Um, but his uh, vision at the lab actually has even gone beyond that. And, and he, his goal has been to, uh, to really get this laboratory to work on the most important scientific and technical challenges faced by the world. And, and to harness uh, uh, this uh, laboratory to work on those problems in ways that wouldn't be possible, for example, by just a few investigators working on their own. And uh, he's, these are some of the principles at work, uh, harnessing the creativity of, of just very specific people and, and helping them along in every way possible from the youngest uh, people in the lab to the most senior ones uh, and working collectively across uh, disciplines and boundaries. There is no such thing as a stovepipe around here uh, once Steve has uh, barreled his way through. And uh, uh, there are many aspects of the instrumentation that he has pushed forward and especially creating these innovative public-private partnerships. I think you saw that in the context of JBay a moment ago. And uh, so those are some of the characteristics. And I wanted to just list up here a few. <laughs> this is by no means a comprehensive list of the amazing number of projects that have suddenly just popped up <laughs> here at the lab and which are happening uh, all at once. And I, I think it's just very important to, to, to look at them and see them. You saw, uh, you saw Jay's talk on JBay and, and uh, the Energy Biosciences Institute is a, 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 an effort with, with BP uh, they're putting in a, a lot of money, half a billion dollars over 10 years into uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, LBL, and University of Illinois to work on the biofuels pro problem. So really, that's a tremendous impact. I'll show you a little bit about this project uh, momentarily. But there are other projects which I just want to mention. I, I just want to take a few minutes and mention them because I think it gives you a sense of the astonishing um, uh, situation we find ourselves in. Arun Majumdar... Uh, has been involved in the energy uh, efficiency and uh, energy and environment technologies division, helping to create a new program called Hyperbrick. I can never get the acronym quite right, but it's something like High Performance Building Research something. And <laughs> the insight here is that uh, today we, we lose, um, today we use 40% of our energy in buildings and 80% uh, of it, at least, you can calculate is just not necessary at all to be using it. So you can bring that 40% down phenomenally. And, and part of that could be done, of course, by just installing individual components. But what the people there have come to realize is that all the components inside the building interact with each other. And through those interactions, you can't just fix one part and have the other work well. 
For example, you might change the windows around thinking you were making things better, but now you might create at certain times of day heat loads that were, shouldn't be there. And then the air conditioning system is working to reverse them. And so you have to conceive of the building as a complete system. And so the people in this part of the laboratory are working right hard right now to put together a program collective with industry to create a laboratory at which people would build uh, a mock building which can be reconfigured. And that reconfigurable building would be like a, a lab building, essentially. Uh, so that's Hyperbrick. Um, there's tremendous discussion going on here uh, about uh, something commonly, someone, sometimes known as the RLS for uh, Roger's light source, Roger Falcone, but, but also perhaps more maturely known as the uh, X-ray laser array or something of that type. A new light source which, which will have uh, the capability of, uh, uh, if it comes to fruition in the future, the capability to um, uh, interrogate the dynamics of chemical bonds on, on much faster timescales and in new ways that aren't uh, possible presently. And, and here I just want to mention, I know Steve has talked about having um, uh, deep affection for both uh, Bay Area institutions, uh, Stanford and Berkeley, and, and he's been involved very heavily in lots of discussions uh, with the people at SLAC uh, to find uh, 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 ways in which the uh, research going on at SLAC and the research at LBL in areas like these can work together and complement each other and add up to more than, and to not to be uh, uh, negatively interfering with each other, but constructively positive. So tremendous activity going on in this area. Uh, we have a battery program here that's a phenomenal battery program and it's undergoing huge growth right now. And uh, it could help solve certain aspects of the energy storage program. And uh, it has the possibility, we hope, of moving away from what it's been in the, partly in the past, where it's been required, really, essentially, by the Department of Energy, just to look at the existing batteries when there are all these wonderful people who want to design completely new ones. And so we're hoping that in the next period of time, all the talent concentrated on this will be able to go after the battery problem in new ways. Uh, new, new efforts here coming online in climate modeling, uh, carbon sequestration and, and heat recirculation, and, and perhaps in the future a synthetic biology user facility. This is only some of the list. It's not a complete list of all the new activities which are emerging around the lab right now. And I think they are a testament, really, uh, to Steve's vision of what the lab can do. And, and I, I mentioned here also this uh, building, which is, this is the molecular foundry. I hope many of you have had a chance to see it. This is a nanoscience research center, which the Department of Energy constructed here at the laboratory. Um, and it's a fascinating place because it involves uh, the idea that um, it's a kind of user facility based on the experience of many of the scientists inside. We've hired about um, 30 new staff scientists uh, who have come in in the last couple of years who have expertise in all different areas of nanoscience. And, and their mission partly, uh, or their mission really is to develop areas of nanoscience on their own, but also to spend half their time cooperating with people from the outside and helping them to do their research. And of course, learning from them in order that their research can get better. So it becomes a tremendous piece of uh, energy, an engine of innovation here at this laboratory uh, for, for nanoscience, that's the molecular foundry. Well, this is the um, new Helios building. Uh, it's not constructed yet, but it almost looks like it is in this uh, computer rendition. Uh, but this is where some of the biofuels research of the Energy Biosciences Institute will go, and this is where some of the artificial photosynthesis work will be. And, and what's remarkable about um, this uh, uh, activity is that it's brought together uh, the, the campus, the lab, the office of the president, the state of California, uh, BP and, and private donors uh, all together to bring the, uh, this uh, type of uh, project into fruition, which is really now very close to, uh, uh, to breaking ground soon. And so, uh, you know, I've been, um, Steve, um, I, uh, slightly before Steve came, okay, uh, slightly before Steve came, uh, you'll recognize these things if you've worked with him, right? Uh, slightly before uh, Steve came, I had a chance to talk with him, and he wanted to know, um, you know, would, would, would a lot of the scientists here wor work with him, rally around him to make some of these things happen? And, and of course the answer was yes from everyone I'm sure he talked to, uh, certainly from me. And so it's been a pleasure to be working with him during this period of time. And you know, the last several months I've, I've, I've been his deputy, so I've had a chance to, walk to watch a lot of this stuff really up close. 
And so, you know, there are some remarkable things. Many crazy things go on in a place like this. And uh, what's great about Steve is he never tries to game the system. He just always returns to first principles. And that's a great, uh, great uh, thing to have. It's not trying to second guess what is somebody else thinking? What are they going to do in some way? How do I, uh, is there some political aspect to it? No, it's always returned to first principles. What is the right thing to do? And uh, also dig down into the details, which is extremely important. Uh, somebody might be coming to you saying that uh, uh, the budget has to be a certain way. Um, Steve will actually know four levels down into it uh, whether or not that uh, makes sense and pick out a salient detail, return to first principles, and go on. Uh, and this, of course, you'll be very familiar with. Uh, work thoughtfully, but radiate impatience, which he does quite well. And, <laughs> and fight for what is right. This is really important, too. And uh, there was the question a moment ago about, uh, is the money enough? <laughs> and I think we all know that... Um, it's absolutely uh, crazy what's going on, that we're not making the kind of effort on the energy problem that absolutely is required in order to solve it. And uh, there's uh, no one who has spent more time uh, uh, in Washington, I around this world, everywhere possible, uh, fighting for getting that uh, to come together. So that's something that's very important. <laughs> now, during this time, <laughs> as he has been doing these things. <laughs> there are a few things that Steve has managed to do, a few documented ones. For example, uh, he has in some rare instances for brief periods of time uh, make the, made the overhead go down. Um, he has made private donations to a, to a national lab seem natural, which is not an obvious thing that it would just happen so easily. Uh, he's also, for those of you who are Berkeley uh, people, has, has actually made dollars flow uphill. Uh, money, money. <laughs> which is more remarkable than the others all, all together, okay? And so, so all of those are things which have happened. But even Steve, superhero, has not been able to solve all the problems. <laughs> so you'll know, for example, those of you who live here, that he personally has sat here in this auditorium on several occasions uh, working uh, to explain what the proposed bus routes are, knows where every stop is, trying to figure out what's the best darn way to make the bus go. Why is Steve spending his time trying to figure out how the bus route should work? Because it really matters. It affects how people get here from the campus. It affects how people get here and do their work. And so it's something that's important. And he's working away on it. And uh, I think that's just quite remarkable. I hope he does succeed. Don't hold your breath. It's a tough one. <laughs> OK, a few quick things. I'm going to go really fast now because uh, there, there's just not time to go into everything in too much detail. But, I was asked to talk about energy, so briefly, I think you all know that um, you can make a silicon solar cell today. It has a electrical, uh, it has an overall, you know, power efficiency of 22 to 24 percent if you pull out all the stops in a silicon system. You know, 18 or 16 or 18 percent might be more typical of what you would buy um, uh, readily, but certainly this is done and is available, and that's quite impressive. But the problem is that it's not quite yet solving our energy problem even though that power efficiency is quite high. And it's not solving it because uh, we can't make enough of them fast enough. It's just too, the process by which we make them is just actually slow. We make giant single crystals, and it's just very slow to make them high quality in this particular technology. And also, the expense is still high. And so they, you know, they're really not finding their way completely uh, into uh, the use that we would like and hope for. Um, now, here's what we actually need. Uh, this is, shows the power consumption. Uh, versus million of acres, and then these lines co correspond to uh, conversion to a, um, a, of the photon. In this case, I'm hypothesizing into a fuel, like what uh, Jay Kiesling was talking about, if we were taking the photon all the way to a fuel, but it hardly matters in any way. Whatever you convert it to, uh, if you do it at a power efficiency uh, photon to usable something or other, uh, if it's at 1%, 3%, or 10%, and then the amount of area that you need to cover and how much total power you'll end up getting. So, for example, um, if you stick here at 58 million acres, uh, that's a plausible number for how much land you might want to use for one of these purposes. Uh, at 1% at, at efficiency, you're actually getting uh, pretty close to eliminating our gasoline needs. And 7, 8, 9% efficiency, you're actually getting close to our total U.S. energy consumption. So, you don't actually need 22, 24% power efficiency. What you really need is 
58 million acres. <laughs> I think that's what people need to focus on in this business. And what I think is often not quite completely understood is that in the solar business, uh, whether you're trying to do it by biofuels or by PVs or by any route that you want to do it, uh, in many ways the issue is that it, it's not strictly an issue of efficiency. It's really an issue ultimately of also scalability. Now, in the biofuels case, you can use an agricultural method and it can scale to very large areas. The efficiencies are perhaps not quite high enough, and that's what Jay was talking about. But when we make an artificial technology, the efficiency can be very high, but scaling it to 58 million acres is just very tough. And so in many ways in this game, a lot of the issues are really around uh, trying to find new ways to make the materials which are, are of interest. And just to give you a feeling, you know, the 58 million acres, if it's solar uh, PV or, or solar artificial photosynthesis, it won't necessarily be in agricultural areas. It could be in desert areas, like for California. That would be quite doable if we had the gumption to build the right transmission lines. We could be doing a lot more already with the technologies that we have. Uh, but you can get a sense here, at least, for California, if we built a box that size and only had 1% efficiency, uh, we would be getting uh, our, our fuel, actually. So um, that's pretty interesting. So we have a project here which has been formed after a lot of effort by Steve and others to make this uh, artificial photosynthesis project. So instead of uh, trying to make the fuels uh, using biological systems, we'd like to make an artificial membrane, but by scalable methods that are, could be done at 58 million acres that would make a fuel uh, with artificial materials. That's a project that we've been involved in for some time. It was funded actually uh, about nine months ago uh, by the Department of Energy um, in one of those very sad stories, originally we have a nice beautiful funding letter that says we got $10 million a year, but then when the budget really came out, it became $5 million a year. And that's really not quite enough to do this project, but, but we're working at it as best we can in the meantime, while we're trying to deal with the problems of not quite having enough oomph right now to get, the, um, to get our whole system moving on this at the scale that it needs to. Anyway, this is the goal. Uh, it's to get at least better than 1% from photon to fuel by all artificial systems but by something that would be really scalable and made by artificial materials. Of course, you could do much better than that. That's nothing like a limit. But if you could do that in a way that was truly making a, 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 a scalable process, that would already be a breakthrough. A lot of people are involved uh, here at the lab. These are all principal investigators. These are some of our partners from other uh, institutions. And uh, this is just a little cartoon of the type of membrane that we would like to make, which essentially would consist of nanoparticles that absorb light they're nanostructured, and so they're structured in some way that they'll separate charge, and they're tied to catalysts asymmetrically so that there might be an oxidizing and a reducing side. And this is just showing water splitting. Of course, you might do more complex chemical transformations if you got good at it. And there's a big biomimetic component to it, but in the end, everything should be made artificially. And um, I'm not sure how I'm doing time-wise. I should move along pretty quickly here. But uh, let me just give you an example of the type of study that people in this project are involved in right now. For example, you can take all of the solar cell, material, or solar cell materials, compound semiconductors that people look at, or silicon and others, and just say, well, let's take all of what's economically judged to be available. Just all that the, it's not all that exists in the world, but it's what the economists judge as could be extracted at the current price. And let's just take all of it, and let's just make it all into solar cell, uh, all of it. Uh, and then see how much power we get, okay? And if you do that, you can see that um, if you fall below this line, then uh, you just don't make enough to really matter in the end in terms of uh, affecting the overall problem. And uh, if, if you get over this line, which is world consumption, then that's a good thing. And the higher you are over this line, the more likely it is that you'll be chosen as a candidate. And it's very interesting because you'll find, I mean, here's crystalline silicon and amorphous silicon, and those are, of course, very interesting candidates, and they looked at very closely for a variety of reasons. But there's a bunch of other materials on here, and there are more than, the study's been done for more materials now than are shown, but there are a bunch of materials on here like iron sulfide and copper sulfide that really bear very close uh, examination because these are materials which in earlier uh, times, in the, let's say, late 60s, early 70s, were studied quite a bit for possible use as solar cell materials. But then, um, in the last oil shock, when the National Renewable Energy Lab really got the mandate to try to develop some solar cell materials, a downselect was made onto a few materials. A downselect was made onto materials like SIGs, 
which is really mm, right on the edge, copper, indium, gallium, selenide, and, and some other materials. Uh, and, and others, which could have actually, this analysis probably wasn't really done at that time, I think. I don't know. And so, you know, it's wide open. You should look at other materials beyond those which have been looked at before. I'm going to skip over some of these things now and just go on. So scientists here, this is some Peidong Yang's work, for example, are developing some systems which are first version, first version water splitters like this, which consists of a um, nano rod of uh, silicon with platinum particles and TiO2 and ruthenium dioxide, all for doing this water splitting. And in this case, we're violating a lot of our tenets. For example, there are elements here which are not abundant enough um, to be used in large enough quantity, and it's fabricated by means that don't scale. But it's just trying to make some, you know, let's get a water splitter and then try to improve on it from there. Now, let me just take two or three minutes and just tell you a little bit about some of the work we're doing ourselves in, in my research group. We've worked for many years on making semiconductor particles. Started doing that. Um, actually, I met Steve when I interviewed for my postdoc at Bell Labs. I'll just say this briefly. Uh, I, I interviewed um, in 1987, I guess, for a, a, a postdoc. And Steve was at Bell Labs at that time. And I met him at that time. And I remember talking to him very vividly because uh, he talked to me about an experiment where he wanted to take a, co a, a, a cooled uh, cloud, a cooled atom, and push it up against the surface to see if it would stick or not uh, to the surface. Uh, the thought being that the de Broglie wavelength would be very, very broad and it, and it may or may not stick. And so I remember that very vividly, but I didn't end up working with Steve. I ended up working with Lewis Bruce. And at that time, we were working on uh, semiconductor particles like these and uh, have continued that work over the years. And these particles, unbeknownst to anyone, turned out to be really great light emitters, which could be used for biological imaging. And so we've uh, worked in that space for quite a few years. And uh, they've, they're used commercially now for that and so on. In the last few years, we've been trying very, very hard to take these particles and develop them into more complex arrangements. And that's what's needed for the artificial photosynthesis project. And, and interestingly, I've put a red one around this because um, these are little branched particles. And in fact, right now, uh, Steve and I sometimes spend a lot of time talking about administrative stuff, but we actually have one joint science project which is looking at some of these branched semiconductor particles and looking at some of their optical properties. And uh, these are materials with much more complex arrangements, shapes, topologies, and they could be very, very useful for the Helios project. So we're going at those great guns, and, and one of the things that we think we can do is we can take a nano rod, which is just made in a beaker, very simply, and we can... Um, add to it, if it's, for example, cadmium sulfide, we can add copper, and it makes a cadmium sulfide, copper sulfide nanoparticle half and half. Half of it's cad sulfide, half of it's copper sulfide, uh, just like this. And that's actually a classic solar cell pair. So if this works out right, we think we can make, in the end, little solar cells individually, which we can then pattern on a surface by just uh, drying out a liquid with the rods in it, which will hopefully stand up vertically. And that would be a process which could perhaps be scaled to very large areas. And yet, the quality of this material is extremely high. Um, that can be seen here in these electron micrographs, which come, by the way, from the team electron microscope. One of the, pro one of the many projects I didn't mention, which has been going on here at the lab, is the generation cooperatively with five other national labs of uh, the ultimate next generation uh, aberration corrected electron microscope, which is the uh, microscope that's taken these images. These particles were just made in a beaker. They weren't grown by some epitaxial technique in vacuum in some complicated way. And they just form spontaneously. You take one kind of material, you add the other, and it makes this interface that's of very high quality, which ultimately could be used um, for making a, a good quality solar cell. Last thing, I heard one of the, I just tossed this in at the very end because um, I, uh, one of the earlier speakers said that Steve was always, uh, I guess it was usually always saying, just go and look, right? So uh, we've been growing these very complicated nanoparticles for a long time, but nobody's ever been able to see how they form. So we've been working for a while now with the National Center for Electron Microscopy postdoc, Jaime Zhang, to develop a little cell in which we can take our nanoparticles and just uh, image them while they're in a fluid. Here you can see some particles inside a liquid. Uh, so these are nanocrystals inside the liquid. And, uh, we can follow their motions. They show very interesting behaviors because what happens is these particles will, will kind of sit on the surface for a while and bounce around. And then every so often they hop 
they move a long distance, then they bounce around, then they hop a long distance. And actually when they're hopping, it turns out, we can show after some analysis, that they're actually rolling on the surface. So they kind of sit there in a potential that binds them to the surface, then they roll, roll like that. It's very interesting to look at those motions, not something that we had expected. But what we're really trying to do is actually observe directly the growth of the nanoparticles in the electron microscope, just to see what happens. And so these are experiments where we're looking at the growth of platinum nanoparticles uh, inside the electron microscope in real time. And uh, we can control the growth regimes. For example, here's particles growing kind of fast. And you see you make a whole bunch of particles at first, and then some of them go away. And uh, so the question is, how does that happen? And so here's some movies. These are now particles growing, and they're just being observed directly in the TEMs. And I, I mentioned this also because there was a lot of talk this morning in the biology session about looking at single molecule trajectories and deconstructing the ensemble. People want to be able to look at something that forms an ensemble, but you want to look at each one individually. And of course that's being done a lot in biophysics now, but this is an example where it's being done where we're looking at the growth of nanocrystals in liquid, and we can see particles popping in and out and all kinds of stuff going on that, that's really quite interesting to us. And taking a page from those of you who do this kind of uh, biophysics, when we look at um, single trajectories, we see lots of interesting phenomena. For example, here we see two particles coming together and fusing versus another particle that was just growing atom by atom uh, during that time. And it's very interesting to look at these trajectories. These are individual particles just growing. Here's two particles fusing. Here's another example, two particles growing. Here's ones that fuse. And maybe what you'll notice here is something totally unexpected to us. That is, when particles fuse, they actually grow slower for a little while after that. They kind of have a period of time where they don't grow as fast. So in the end, they all kind of catch up to each other. And probably they all catch up to each other because in the end, the size that's being dictated has something to do with the surface energy that's saying, okay, you're all, all the particles are going to be about this size. But, but how they get there can vary enormously. Some can just grow atom by atom. Others can fuse. But in the end, they kind of end up coming out roughly somewhere near the same size. It's very fascinating to us and something we're having a lot of fun with. That's an example of a tool. If we ever want to make this uh, project work where we're going to make these um, solar cells, we have to be able to see how these things grow. Uh, if we don't understand how they grow, we'll probably never succeed in really making uh, the best quality ones uh, that will be needed. They have to be very high quality and, of course, mass produced in, in large volume in a liquid probably and then cast onto a surface. So uh, those are my thoughts, and thank you very much. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it's certainly true that the... Especially, and then also cost to correct. So let me say that right now, in, for example, we have some experiments on this that are interesting. Right now, uh, in Germany, in Europe, there's a, a, a fixed subsidy in place for um, anyone that can sell electricity into the grid. So if you can sell electricity into the grid, the cost that you'll get back is a fixed amount that's been set, it's <coughs> subsidized, it's been subsidized for a 20-year period. I guess they're a few years into it now. So, And in that environment, um, there are a bunch of companies that have emerged that are um, buying land or leasing land for that time period and then uh, running around the world trying to find solar cells to put on them so they can sell the electricity. <laughs> okay, And they can't get enough solar cell. They're, 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 they'll, make, they'll cut you a contract today for solar cells that you would deliver in five years and they'd be happy. So uh, it's very clear that the existing technology, you, know, you can argue about the merits one way or another about whether it's you know, one thing or another, but we just can't make enough the way we do it presently. We just can't scale it up to the kind of, I mean, even in that case, which is a fairly limited one, we can't really quite make enough stuff. But you're certainly right, the cost is tremendously important. And uh, if you really want to see large scale penetration, the cost has to come down a factor of three to five for the whole thing. So it's a substantial factor. That's not a little factor in this kind of thing. You know, if you really want to see it be subsidy free and, and just competing on the, you know, openly for electricity. I think that's an issue you raised about what's the right conversion efficiency, right? And yeah, and the point is, land 
No, it's not that much. It is a little bit, but not, you know, it's a little bit related to the cost of the land. And you're certainly right that there's a certain threshold efficiency that you have to hit. And it's in the, it's in the 8 to 10 percent range. If you don't hit that efficiency range, then the balance of system cost is not, you know, won't make it. It doesn't, doesn't cross over. But even at 10 percent, it already does with the subsidy that's present, uh, you know, in the German system. Of course, if you can get to 15 percent, it's even better, okay? But you don't actually need to get to, uh, you know, even better if you can do even better. I'm just saying that, you know, a, a lot of the uh, thinking that people have had, which is that you have to hit the highest possible efficiency, isn't entirely, you know, it, it, scale is just as important. You have to factor that in just as much. Well, for the interest of time, yeah. we'll take two more questions. Sure. One, yeah. Well, uh, okay. I think that the uh, you know the, the that there's a uh, it's a moving target. The technology's changing. It's changing in industry, and it's also changing in the research phase. Both are changing very quickly. Uh, so uh, that's a good reason why what we need is very close partnership again between the industry and, and the universities and the labs to make sure we're all kind of on the same page. You could, for example, you know, misunderstand that and be working on something that's important. But my personal opinion on it is that um, uh, there's still room for, uh, I think the existing technologies have plenty of market, <laughs> okay? but. Uh, for them to get up to where they're supplying a big fraction of our energy still probably requires a breakthrough. That's my opinion. Thank you. Final question. So I have a comment and a question. The comment has to do with your observations about the uh, behavior of nanoparticles uh, in the nylon surface, mm -hmm. the diffusion and the rolling. Looking at those pictures, it reminded me of a thing called levy flights. Yes, those are levy flights, oh, yes. Okay. Oh yeah, that's done. There's an advantage. What's the deal there? Is that really competitive? Is it competitive? Uh, there's a mature technology there for doing that uh, that exists. Uh, there's a wonderful company uh, here in uh, the Bay Area uh, that actually uh, called BrightSource, which has its um, uh, much of its birth here at the lab, <laughs> which is uh, uh, has contracts with uh, PG&E to build some factories of that type. If they could just get the transmission lines built at the same time, they would be doing a lot better. So that solar thermal technology is there, uh, and it, it has promise. You know, it could be used a lot more. The Europeans are looking at it very closely because they'd like to use, uh, you know, uh, have such factories perhaps even in the Middle East and pipe electricity. So, you know, there's an interest in that. In the end, thermodynamically, I think you can appreciate the difference between taking the two electron volt photon and thermalizing it versus keeping the energy uh, and using it to make something thermodynamically more favorable, either the electricity or if you could make a molecule, that, you know, then it's, that's thermodynamically much more favorable than ultimately just converting it to heat. So you know, you'd like to do that. Sure, but thermal... It's not bad. Plants operate yeah. what, 40% there's, there's a lot of room for so doing that. There's a lot of room. You mean their power efficiency? Or yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, you, with, with um, concentrators, you could make no, no. Uh, you can. Pretty high temperature too. I'm just wondering. Yeah, they operate pretty efficiently, actually. I don't remember. I don't have a number in my head, but the efficiency of those is quite impressive, actually. So there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be said for them. There's a lot to be said for them. I think we should stop our discussion now. Thank you very much, Paul. Wonderful. So that's the end of energy science session.